This Mahamudra realization that we were describing yesterday, when this is achieved, automatically there arises with it a compassion towards the state of other beings. These two exist uh, together. If one arises, then so does the other. <laughs> On the other hand, if we truly develop uh, this compassion or the precious enlightened attitude, then this itself, if it is properly cultivated and developed in the mind, this itself gives rise to the experience of the realization of Mahamudra. Why should this be the case? Shantideva described how the development of the enlightened attitude is the most powerful means for destroying the effects of evil actions, even a very even the most vicious of evil actions, the effects of these can be destroyed by truly cultivating an enlightened attitude. That in itself, this purification, gives rise or gives rise to the opportunity for the realization of Mahamudra. Why is this? The point is that that which stops us or prevents us from perceiving this true nature of mind, this Mahamudra realization, are the obs are the obscurations which are created by a negative and evil action. So if these evil actions and their effects if these evil evil actions and their effects are removed, then the way is clear for Mahamudra realization. <coughs> <coughs> Shantideva also discussed uh, the effects of virtuous actions. If a virtuous deed, a good act is performed by an ordinary person without any, uh, without the enlightened attitude, 
there is an effect, there is a beneficial effect, but it does not persist. However, if the same act is, is uh, performed by someone who does have the enlightened attitude, has that motivation that we call the enlightened attitude, then the effects of that act <coughs> multiply and increase. The benefit that is derived from this multiplies and multiplies. The point is <coughs> that the effect of one's actions depend entirely upon the motivation with which one performs those actions. And the correct motivation to have for the greatest benefit is the enlightened attitude. Shant in Shantideva's verse, he likened this to a tree which grows to full fruit. The Hinayana approach is the one without the enlightened attitude. There, the effects of, the positive, of all positive actions are like a, a branch that bears fruit, but then withers and dies and yields nothing further. However, actions performed within the perspective of the enlightened attitude, or with the enlightened attitude, are like a tree which comes to bloom, and with many branches, leaves, much fruit, and then more fruit the next year, and continually providing more and more fruit. <coughs> There are in this world many uh, problems, particularly the uh, fear of uh, wars and conflicts within country, between countries. There are many areas of the world where these sort of conflicts are actually in process of happening. Um, what is the source of all of this? Where does this come from? The point is that uh, the minds of beings contain these emotional defilements of uh, history, was it? anger, pride, and uh, jealousy. It is these that give rise to these conflicts, particularly um, the emotion of anger. <laughs> Making 
give an example. If uh, another person uh, says something nasty to one or harms one in some minor or small way, this can give rise to a feeling of anger in oneself. What one should do is to be patient, tolerate the situation, to blend one's enlightened attitude with this situation. In other words, to transform the feelings that arise into the enlightened attitude. Now, if this happens, then the anger that arises in one's own mind has no effect. It does not control us. We do not allow it to control us by um, contemplating and cultivating the enlightened attitude at that moment in time. The effect of this, of course, is that one's own anger towards the other person subsides and no harm is done and the other person's anger against oneself tends to subside as well and even less harm is done. There is an interrelationship here that is extremely important. The effect we have on others, we should attempt to be friendly towards others, to be loving towards others, kind, considerate, compassionate towards others. Others should be the focus for our development of the enlightened attitude and in this way spread this pacifying influence through many many people. <laughs> someone harms oneself, then one tends to feel angry towards that person, and one should attempt to cultivate the enlightened attitude at that time, transform one's uh, emotions by means of developing this enlightened attitude. If one is able to pacify that situation, uh, then one self does no harm, and the other person himself or herself creates no harm. If we consider the other person, we will realize that that other person will, if they continue to harm others, as that person might be harming oneself, then that is going to yield very negative results for that person. They will have to endure cyclic existence further. They are acting in error. 
and those errors will multiply and will be the source for their experience of the hells and the whole of psychic existence. So I want you to feel compassionate towards the other person for this sort of reason. <coughs> Now, in developing this compassion towards others, we should uh, we could use the uh, method of a, a, a meditation which is called the taking and the giving and receiving contemplation. The point here is that one is wanting to give out of one from oneself all virtue, good, and so on, and share this with others, and to take on to oneself the sufferings and the emotional defilements of others. In this actual contemplation, we imagine as we breathe out, white light traveling with the breath, and that reaching all beings, taking with it all uh, virtue, benefit, and so on from oneself, and purifying those beings. But on the other hand, when we breathe in, we should imagine dark black light streaming into oneself, and then one is taking from all beings onto and into oneself all their emotional defilements. Uh, not just anger, of course. There are others as well. Uh, anger, jealousy, pride, arrogance, and so forth. All of them we should consider, and illnesses as well, we should consider that we bring onto one, uh, ourself, and thereby transmute these things within oneself using the enlightened attitude. In this process, we purify, we do not take actually evil onto ourselves at all, but purify the evil which is in ourselves by means of this development of the attitude of wishing to take it upon ourselves. <laughs> There's one thing I left out from the last remarks is that if one develops this compassion in this correct way towards the others that might be able to, that might be in a position to harm us, by our response to them, our patient response to them, we find that uh, we are able in the end to be able to help them, to guide those people more. A very important uh, function of our practice is the ability eventually to be able to really guide and help others. And that is only developed in this way by means of the correct cultivation of uh, the enlightened attitude. Practice of the Dharma, as the Buddha said, control the mind perfectly. In his uh, famous verse, stating what the Buddha's teachings were, control the mind perfectly. Our practice, Dharma practice, the point of it is to tame and to control and to train the mind by means of the various things that we do that control and overcome the effects of the emotional defilements. <coughs> tame these things, to control them. That is the whole point of and of every aspect of Dharma practice. <laughs> Again, I left something out from last time. The central core of this practice is certainly the emotional defilements to control 
within the the attack on the emotional defilements. Once that is broken, it is easier to achieve over the, the purification of the emotional defilements. All these things prevent us from uh, perceiving the true nature of reality, uh, the state of Mahamudra that we have talked about. And until we have achieved uh, the true uh, vision of experience of Mahamudra realization uh, by means of uh, overcoming our clinging to the real nature, uh, to the real nature of the world, believing it to be truly existent and so on. Until we have achieved this state, then there are many problems uh, that we have to face. And these problems cause us suffering, fear, and so on. There are many things, uh, untimely death, illnesses, sufferings, uh, we talk in terms of the eight great terrors, the 16 great terrors, and so on. Now, in our meditation practices, all day it is, in fact, uh, that we use protect from these eight and 16 great terrors and all the others. However, there is one that is particularly, uh, the particular activity of which is the protection from these terrors, that is white tar. <laughs> The teachings of Waitara originate in the Tara Yogini Tantra taught by the Buddha. Then, uh, following on the basis of this, uh, there are many great panditas and experts that wrote uh, commentaries and meditation practices con uh, uh, concerned with the Taras, not just white Tara, green Tara, and others. And, however, this gives rise to many different lineages of uh, white Tara. This particular one today with which we're concerned stems from Atisha. There are many stories of uh, great uh, teachers having had visions of the Taras and so forth. Amongst these is one concerning Gampopa. Uh, Gampopa, uh, at the age of 42, was in retreat up in the mountains and had a vision of a dark king that told him that within three years he would, he would be dead. Later, he, on, on his travels, met up with a Kadampa teacher, a teacher from the Kadampa school, discussed this with him, and the teacher from the Kadampa school told him that uh, if Gampopa was to live, he would be able to bring great benefit uh, 
to many beings, but it was clear that he did not have a long life expectancy. Jambaba asked him if there was anything in particular he could do to help, if there was any instruction he could give him that would be some means to overcome this problem. And it was Dwight Tara that this uh, that was the particular instruction that this teacher from the Kadampa school gave to Jambaba. Uh, he told him that the practice of Dwight Tara would enable him to remove all obstacles uh, to his health that would uh, prevent him having a long life. Jambaba lived to the age of 80. So this uh, tradition of white hour meditation was passed down from Gampopa through the line of the Kamapas, just the Jampa and so forth, down to the last Kamapa, uh, the 16th, Rongjung uh, Rupa Doje. Uh, it was from him that, from His Holiness, that Tengu Rinpoche received this empowerment. He is using today, again, the Chikshe Kundro text of Wangfa Doje, that empowerment he received from His Holiness Kamapa. And the identical empowerment is also contained within the Kaju Natsa collections of major initiations of the Kama Kaju tradition, again, which Tengu Rinpoche received from His Holiness. <laughs> When Rinpoche was about eight or nine years old, the previous Sanjin Yenpa Rinpoche told him that Waitara was his idam, and he started the practice of Waitara at that age, started immediately. When Rinpoche was in his early 20s, about 22 or 23 years old, in a three-year retreat, he spent one year and about two or three months of that time uh, solely practicing his idam, Waitara. Um, whenever, now this was Rinpoche's retreat practice, obviously, and ever since then he has always tried whenever he has been able to go into retreat to practice his idam practice. Whenever he has time, he does this. Sometimes it's for a period of nine months or a few months or perhaps even a few, only a few days. But at every opportunity when the time is available, he spends his time in the retreat. When he is in retreat in this way, of course, he is counting the mantras, doing his Waitara practice in the proper way, doing the Nyendra, or Seva Sadhana, it is in Sanskrit. In everyday life, he is always continually repeating, con continuing this practice, um, performing the Seva Sadhana of Waitara at every available opportunity. He then finished, and I asked him how many he had done so far. Um, 61 million is the answer. Thank you. 
should do is take one yidam and do that one yidam practice thoroughly and properly. One should do the seva sadhana for that deity at all times. Do the generation process meditations, the perfection process meditations, and concentrate on one yidam. That is the best, of best approach to take, never finishing it. If one takes this approach, taking one knee down and doing it thoroughly, then it is really quite easy to develop the true inspiration of that deity. It can be quite simple and very effective. <laughs> Whatsoever. 
one should be, one should have the same attitude towards whether one practice shows signs of, of effect, any effect, or shows no signs at all. One should think that the uh, best way for my practice to proceed is for through many, many, many years, absolutely no sign of any results whatsoever. To simply not mind about these things, to be, have, have a sense of total equanimity. This is very important indeed to be aware of this trap into which one can fall. One must be very careful not to um, get excited or pleased or enthusiastic over signs of success in the practice. Jay said to me just now, um, I was watching you dancing last night, the things you were doing your ha with your hands. What were you doing in practice? <coughs> your colour chakra movements. <laughs> <laughs> Rinpoche will now first give the uh, uh, textual transmission lung for the Grundra practice, which uh, several people have requested, and this will be followed by the uh, tra textual transmission for the White Tara practice for this Prabhupada's clear. This, these two will then be followed by the White.